Thank you. It's great to be with you and uh, here at the, I think this is kind of the end of the festival. So have you had a good time? Good, 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 great. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk today about uh, one of the two most common questions that I get everywhere around the world where I speak. The, the most common questions are, number one, uh, this is all warm and fuzzy, you know, and I talk about pigness of pigs and chickenness of chickens and tomatoness of tomatoes and, um, you know, uh, connecting to your ecological womb and all these nice, cool little things and compost piles and, you know, earthworm copulations and all sorts of cool stuff, all right? But the big question is, this is all nice and warm and fuzzy, but can we really feed the world? And I've found that even among our tribe, and I'm just going to assume we're all in the same tribe here, unless there's some Monsanto plant in the audience, um, <laughs> that, that there's this, this deep, um, you know, concern that, boy, you know, if it just hadn't been for chemical fertilization and the Faber-Bosch, uh, you know, process and, and, and chemical fertilizers and herbicides, boy, I, I just don't, I, the green revolution, I'm just not sure we could have fed the world. And so there's that nagging question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that once and for all for you today. The other question is, well, this is all fine and dandy, but, but local food's expensive, and is this not really an elitist movement, and what can we do about price? And I'll be talking about that in California, not here. <clears throat> so let's deal with this first question. Can we feed the world? Can this really feed the world? I want to, I want, I want to start with a, with a broad um, understanding today of why, every time you open the New York Times or, and see a report from the United Nations or the World Watch or the World Wildlife Fund or... Uh, you know, UNESCO or USAID or, or whatever, you see these, these um, you know, reports, World Health Organization. And um, all of them agree that, you know, organics or ecological food production can't feed the world. And uh, that our kind of farming can't feed the world. Well, how do they come up with the statistics, the data? So let me give you a couple real life stories. The first one takes back about 30 years to Virginia, to our own land-grant university, Virginia Tech, which is about 80 miles south of us. And I don't have a vendetta against Tech. We're just on different planets. But basically, uh, Virginia Tech, this was in about 30 years ago, and, and organics was just starting to come to the fore. You know, people were just starting to learn how to say the O word. And um, so they decided to do some research there to see how you know, productive and how efficacious organics could be. And so they had these um, these these hundreds of test plots that they'd been using um, since the you know, chemical revolution. They'd been testing DDT and you know, Agent Orange and uh, you know, atrazine and, and, and 10, 10, 10 chemical fertilizer and anhydrous ammonia and all these things you know, for since, well, since the 1940s on all these test plots. This is you know, the 1970s, so we're you know, 30, 40 years into using these test plots with chemicals. And so they, they say, um, all right, we're going we're gonna to test this. So these plots right here, these five will be our organic plots. And uh, these will get our regular, you know, um, cornucopia of goodies, of chemical concoctions. And so they planted a corn here in these four or five, and then they planted a corn out here. And, um, of course, the organic plots, they didn't do anything to. You know, they just, there it is. Plant the corn. That's what organics is, right? Okay. So plant the corn. And uh, at the end of the season, of course, this plot's all full of weeds, got little, you know, shrimpy corn here, and they, 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 uh, they pick it, and they measure out and extrapolate it to how, many, how much corn per acre this would be, and they go over here, and these plots are nice and big and green and nice, you know, bushels of, of, of corn and all this, and they extrapolate that out. And I can well remember, well remember, I was, you know, maybe in my late teens or early 20s when our commissioner of agriculture in Virginia came out with his official statewide report that based on this research at the taxpayer-funded Virginia Tech land-grant university, if we went to organics, we would have to pick which half of the world to kill because we could only feed half of the world. Now, anybody familiar with agronomy and um, the soil life food web and all that, what's the big problem with the research 
that I just uh, put forward? What's, what's the problem? Absolutely, they, they, you, 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 they, did, they get organic by neglect. Yeah, it was um, over here they put on all this stuff, and here, those of us who do this, we know that after a soil's been sterilized to death and chemicalized to death, it takes at least three to five years to replace all of the gibberellins and the acidobacter and the mycelium and the fungi and the nematodes and the protozoa and the earthworms and all that cornucopia of soil life that numbers more in a healthy handful of healthy soil than there are people on the face of the planet. I mean, it is a, it is a community of beings. It's a fundamental community of beings. And, and they're all, you know, eating each other and, and uh, dissecting and having meetings and going to wanderlust festivals and doing all sorts of crazy things, you know. I don't know what their yoga moves are, but anyway, um, you know, th th there, it, this, this is an amazing community of beings that doesn't even register on the radar of Wall Street. You know, in the newspaper, we see the Wall Street, you know, the, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Averages going up and down. You know, we don't have a similar... Uh, um, you know, graph for the earthworms. <laughs> we don't have a graph like that for the mycorrhizae. You know, um, you know, another parking lot got paved. You know, ecology went down. You know, those kinds of things. Um, so we we have this kind of research, and that is what fuels the entire data collection system. You know, let's take, uh, let's take the UN Long Shadow Report um, talking about uh, how you know, cows are destroying the ecosystem. And all of the research is based on continuous grazed herbivores, which are not biomimicry, and on a feedlot grain-based diet system at the end. That is also assaultive of the herbivore role. The, the, the herbivore role in nature is to be a pruner of the perennial forage to prune it back to a fast teenage production cycle, what I call a biomass accumulation restart button. That's the role of the herbivore in nature. That's why there aren't any ecosystems except Antarctica that don't have any herbivores. Think about it. You know, guinea pigs and llamas and alpacas and giraffes and elephants and rhinos and sloths, and kangaroos, and reindeer, and buffalo, and cows, and sheep, and I mean, dirt, bighorn sheep, and reindeer, and you know, there's a lot of herbivores. Why? Because plants need pruning, just like a viticulturalist would prune an orchard, or a uh, or a vineyard and, a, and an orchardist would prune uh, apple trees to stimulate more verdant, productive growth. So the herbivore prunes the forage to restart the fast S-curve part. See, the lower part, all grass grows on an S-curve. The lower part of the S, I call that diaper grass. This is teenage grass, and this is nursing home grass. Okay? So the point is that if you overgraze or undergraze, in both cases, whether it's senescence or whether it's, um, you know, pounding into the ground, in either case, you stop the photosynthetic activity, the flow of solar energy into biomass to decompose to feed the earthworms, all right? So if we want a vibrant ecosystem, we need the herbivore to prune that off. But that is not the system that our conventional uh, um, you know, agriculture has. And so when the United Nations or when some, you know, uh, um, PhD professor studies the existing system, the existing system is completely broken. And so the data, obviously, is making the assumption of an assault on ecology rather than studying a system that is a massage, a caresser of this ecological womb. And so when you open the newspaper, when you see the scientific reports, the data is skewed. The data is wrong. The thing you have to understand is that science is not objective. Science is fundamentally subjective because it only answers the questions that can be posited in the mind of the seeker. 
And the seekers of our data currently have to come through the sieve of credentialed, accredited uh, uh, systems of thought of the scientific community that don't allow them to think about biomimicry and caressing this ecological umbrella. They don't even, they don't even think that, that, uh, that animals are, um, are, are biological beings. They view animals and plants uh, as just inanimate particles or protoplasmic structure to be manipulated, however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate them. And so the only question is, how do we grow it faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper? And intuitively, we know that that's not a very good goal. I mean, that's why the average NFL football player is dead at 57. When your neck is bigger than your head, you're a freaking nature. Nature weeds you out. It's the way it works. Nature, nature tends toward balance, you see. And so a, a mechanical view of life is a fundamental assault on life. Life is fundamentally biological, which is not mechanical. What's the fundamental difference? The fundamental difference is living things can heal. Machines don't. You know, if you have a, when you go home today, if you have a, a thump, thump, thump in the right uh, front wheel bearing of your car, um, uh, and it goes out, you, know, you can get out of your car and you can, you, know, you can lay hands on that wheel bearing, you can apologize, oh, I'm so sorry I didn't lubricate you. You know, I mean, you can, you can ask forgiveness all day and you can, you know, uh, beg. You, do you need to rest a little bit? Okay, you can rest. I'll, I'll go here and let you rest for, you know, a day. Uh, you can let it rest for five years. When you get back in the car and start, what's it going to do? Thump, 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 right? Machines don't heal. Life can heal. Because we can abuse the ecology. And guess what? We can come in and heal that abuse. We can abuse a relationship. And forgiveness can make it heal. Life is not mechanical. And yet that's the underpinning of the whole genetically modified organism movement is viewing the, the, the sacredness and the, and the, the, the holiness of, this is Sunday, isn't it? Okay, that's fine. We can talk about it. Holiness of, 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 of the genetic DNA, whether you're a creationist or an evolutionist, the point is that where we are is where we are because fundamentally design works. And there are a lot of hurdles to make sure that we don't view it as machinery. I mean, the closest nature has ever let us come to, to, uh, you know, to messing this up is mating a horse with a donkey, you know, and it gives a what? Mule. And what's interesting about a mule? They're sterile. It's like you can go this far, but no farther, you know, and we come, you know, like a bunch of swashbuckling pirates, you know, coming into this sacred place and making beings that nature has lots of of protective walls, security systems to make sure that these speciations don't get breached. So the reports that you read, I'll just give you another example. So, so a, a PhD says he's going to research GMO rice production in Vietnam. And so he takes his dutiful little, you know, master's students, assistants, you know, with him over to a summer research project in Vietnam, right? And they set up their test plots in their rice paddies. They're going to put the GMO uh, golden rice here, and, um, and then over here are going to be the, uh, the other, you know, more traditional production units. And, um, and so they, you know, they plant the GMO rice here. They put on the, con you know, the cornucopia of, of, you know, concoctions, chemical concoctions over here. And over here, they have their indigenous plots where they have rice widely spaced. They have um, tilapia fish um, in the, uh, eating the um, weeds and stuff that are, uh, that are growing. They've got uh, ducks uh, swimming around that eat the snails that attack the rice roots and lay eggs and, of course, grow up and make meat. And around the edges of the indigenous rice paddies, they've got planted uh, bok choy and Chinese cabbage all around the edges. And so they've got these. And so at the end of the season, the uh, professor and his team, they, you know, they measure the rice from this patty, and they measure the rice from this patty, and they extrapolate it to so much rice per acre, and they, and they say, see, um, if, if we did, you know, without these uh, GMO and, and chemically concocted systems, half of the world would starve because our production was 
uh, three times as much rice over here as over here. Now, what's the obvious question? Yeah, oh, what about the fish, the ducks, the duck eggs, the, the, um, the bok choy, and the Chinese cabbage? You know what the answer is? We didn't come to study those things. We came to study rice production. And see, our whole scientific community is, is, is limited, is held hostage by a Greco-Western reductionist, linear, compartmentalized, individualized, parts-oriented, systematic right? System that doesn't view holes. How do you study holes in a linear mindset? You don't. And so you have to understand that every single time you read a scientific report, it has been squeezed. The data, the, the research, the, 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 the background thinking has been squeezed through this this assumption, this paradigm that is extremely limited to a Western Greco-Roman systematized, fragmentized, democratized, individualized, parts-oriented, non-connected kind of system. Living systems, ecological systems, are fundamentally holistic where it's all about relatives, it's about connections and networks, and it's, it's, it's the, the whole is worth more than the sum of the parts, and we're all related, and it's, it's all about us and not I, and right? That's, that's the difference. And so take that. Just, just file that back in your thinking. What I want you to, I want to empower you to think critically as you read these reports that say, we can't feed the world with this other food. All right, that's just the preamble. Now, we're ready to get in the nitty-gritty. First thing, can we feed the world? You have to understand that right now, right now, the world throws away more human edible food than any time in human history. Right now, we throw away. I mean throw away like, like throw away. 50% of all human edible food on the planet. What that means is that if I could wave a magic wand here today, if I could suddenly, you know, have sovereign power, and I could wave a wand and say, today we're going to double food production on the earth, not one more person would eat better. It takes a little while to absorb that truth. Nobody goes hungry because there's not enough food. People go hungry for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's a lack of interest in good food. We all know plenty. I mean, that's why uh, we are the most overfed, undernourished nation in history. You know, the number of people that are obese on the planet are exactly the same number of people that are hungry on the planet. You know, talk about yin-yang. I mean, that's, that's, that's like, you know, Plus minus, right? So it's not a matter of production. Lots of times the, bad, the, the hunger is, is socio-political unrest. You know, the, the Red Cross truck can't go across, you know, some warlord's clansman's land who stand there with an Uzi, you know, demanding some sort of a, you know, a bribe or something in order for the truck to get through. Or, or a lack of infrastructure or, uh, you know, ethnic cleansing. Or, or I mean, there, there, there are tons of reasons for hunger. The one that's not true is that there's not enough food. Every day we throw away enough food to feed the planet a second time. All you got to do is go dumpster diving for a while and you'll see. I mean, down in North Carolina, uh, just south of us, North Carolina, there's a yogurt plant that dumps tractor trailer loads of milk daily. Why? Well, maybe it's spoiled. Maybe it came out of temperature. Lots of times they found a, a antibiotic residue, okay, from, the, from somebody treating his cows for mastitis, and they've got antibiotic residue, something, okay, dump this milk. Now, long ago, all of this spoiled food was eaten by chickens and pigs. That's why every homestead had a few chickens next to it. 
Today, it's basically dumped. I just talked to a guy that went to a green bean factory in uh, Zimbabwe. They export green beans to Europe. And they actually sell about two tons a day in this processing center, but they throw away five tons a day. Why? Well, they're crooked, or they're too long, or they're too short, or they have some little blemish. You go to the supermarket. Go to the go outside the produce stand. Outside the you know you will see you will see enough food to feed the entire area. Uh, uh, I talked up in um, Ontario to the Rural Mayors Association of Ontario. Had a mayor come up to me subsequently. Came down to visit for the farm, and uh, they had a farm nearby that grows a butternut squash. Now, I don't know about you, but I love butternut squash. That's 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 like ice cream almost, not quite, but it's good stuff. All right, and. Um, so they had this farmer uh, in their community that had a contract with a big, you know, food processor to grow butternut squash. So, you know, he, he grew, he was supposed to grow so many pounds. And uh, they had a drought that year that didn't do very well. And so he was penalized on his contract, actually had to pay, you know, a, a punitive thing to the food processor because he wasn't able to meet his contract for the squash. So next year we signed a contract, said, well, I'll, you know, I'm going to make sure that I got enough. So, you know, what he did, he planted twice as much acreage as he thought he would actually have to have. So in the worst case scenario, he'd still meet his contract. Well, of course, you know what happened. Had a bumper crop year, great rain, and literally tractor trailer loads of butternut squash. The processor took up to their contract. We don't need any more. He's got tractor trailer loads of butternut squash out in the field. So he contacts this mayor, whose wife happens to be in charge of the food bank and the whole, you know, the food the Salvation Army, and she's all into in the charity and, and food charity work in the area. And so she mobilizes forces. And at the end of the day, they were only able to salvage about three wheelbarrow loads of butternut squash because all of the people that they served through the food relief program looked at the butternut squash and said, what do you do with this? They're used to stuff in a can. Or in a frozen dinner. And this happens every day all around the world. The fact is that there is plenty of food being produced. And it has never gone to waste in such unprecedented volumes. Because, there, because while the industry likes to paint itself as this wonderful, efficient system, the fact is that there are huge, huge inefficiencies when things don't quite fit the box or when things sit in a warehouse for a little bit too long. All sorts of inefficiencies. The dumping. I mean, just uh, 10 years ago when we had our last avian influenza outbreak in, in our area, they landfilled 1,000 tractor trailer loads of poultry. That was a direct result of the efficiencies of concentrated animal feeding operations. Many of you may be aware that there's a very a growing um, uh, alligator uh, market for alligator meat and, and leather, for alligator shoes and pocketbooks and things like that. And um, they're trying to situate these next to um, uh, pig CAFOs down south. I mean, you can't grow alligators up in New York, right? So they're locating these down south near the pig factories, so all the dead pigs in the factory in, in the confinement animal factories can be fed to the alligators, and now you can salvage those dead pigs, you know, and at least turn them into alligator leather and meat to be sold in exotic restaurants and, and make handbags and sandals for you know nice discriminating customers. So <laughs> so these these are amazing inefficiencies of the system, of, of the industrial system. They're huge inefficiencies. Now, why have we gotten to this, this kind of prejudicial look? All right, let's go back to history. Let's go set the context. It's, we're going we're gonna to go back in time, and it's 1910. 1910. I don't think anybody in this room was born in 1910. So let me refresh your memory about 1910, because I was there. All right? 1910. Every metropolitan newspaper in the country is printing editorials about the demise 
of the urban center. The city in America is dead. Why? Because they're covered up in horse poop. 1910 is right before the Model T Ford. Nobody could foresee that at that point. And so the urban centers, which were attracting people flooding out of the rural uh, uh, countryside to come to the new factories in the industrial, as the industrial engine of America uh, cranked up, and the urban centers needed all this labor, and so, far, so, so farm kids were coming to the cities, flocking to the cities, but remember, the cities did not yet have electrification. Street lamps were still run on heavy oil. It was one thing to raise, you know, to, to, to be in the country and only take a bath once a month. It was quite another to be in a city and not take a bath once a month. It was one thing in the country to have a horse with a stable. It was another thing in the city to have a stable next to every house. In a time before mechanized transportation where there simply wasn't enough enough mule trains and ox carts and teamsters running wagon loads of poop out of the city and hay and grain and fodder into the city it was it was inefficient and so the poop was building up it was in the it was in the street it was in the gutter it was you, you drug it into the you know the confectionery shop when you went in you you know you drug it into your hotel when you went in it was on your shoes it was everywhere and everybody was tired of shoveling poop poop was everywhere there were flies everywhere there was no refrigeration are you with me there was no indoor plumbing Plastic pipe had not been invented yet. Okay? There was a universal concern at that time, a worldwide concern, that the planet would starve to death. Because remember, by 1910, Pa Ingalls and his family had already gone west. There were no more virgin lands to exploit. In the U.S. and Australia, which were the last two frontiers, Australia was fully developed, the U.S. was fully developed, there were no virgin lands to go to. And the, depth, the, the, the soil loss and the erosion loss and the lack of productivity of the old plantation south and the old farm of, of, eastern, of the eastern part of the uh, country, uh, it, it, was, it was worn out. And there was this huge question, how do we feed? The world. How are we going to grow? And so many of the leaders thought we were actually going to all starve to death by about 1925. You can read about it. How do we do that? Well, two groups of people started looking at that question. One dated back to Justice von Liebig, the Austrian chemist, who in 1837, using vacuum tubes, made his great announcement to the world that life is simply reconfigurations of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus and basically launched the chemical view of agriculture. There was a, another view that grew out of the Romantic period. Bish, Shelley, Keats, and uh, um, John, you know, Audubon, and the, the early, you know, John Murr, and, and the early leaders of the environmental movement there who said life is not just chemical. It's more than that. It's, it's biological. And these two groups of people tried to figure out how do we maintain soil fertility? Well, interestingly, about that time, we came to two great worldwide catastrophes. World War I and World War II. And interestingly, what is um, used to build ammunition and bombs is what? Nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. Amazing. So the war effort, through tons of money and science, laboratories, distribution, mining, chemistry, all sorts of things at developing nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus in the war effort of World War I, World War II. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, taking the biological thread was a very quiet Britisher working in India, 
still a protector of the, of the British Empire, named Sir Albert Howard. And Sir Albert Howard, he wasn't Sir Albert Howard when he started, he was knighted later, but Sir Albert Howard worked in, in India. And what he did there was develop the scientific formula for aerobic composting. See, if you go to any, um, any agricultural or historical museum, and let's say you go to Williamsburg or Jamestown or Plymouth Rock or any of the old, you know, kind of heritage American living history museums, you know what you'll never see? You'll never see a compost pile. It wasn't done. It wasn't done. And so Sir Albert Howard, working there with his whole career from about 1910 to 1940, developed the, the, the nitrogen, the, the water, the microbes, the air, for, and, the, and, and temperature requirements for modern scientific aerobic composting which he introduced to the world in his 1943 iconic book, The Foundation of Sustainable Agriculture, we'd call it, An Agricultural Testament. I think it's fascinating that the, the scientific aerobic compost pile came to the world about the same time as the Green Revolution in chemistry, in chemical agriculture. They were about the same age. The problem was that to do large-scale on-farm carbon, uh, carbon cycling through composting required an infrastructure that had not yet been developed. And farmers and everybody was tired of shoveling poop. We didn't have chippers. We didn't have the internal combustion engine available. To, I mean, many rural areas didn't even have electricity. Our, our area of Virginia didn't get uh, um, electrification until 1950. Um, some areas of the U.S. didn't get it until the 1960s. Some down in Georgia, um, so we, we didn't have that. We didn't have uh, we didn't have water conveyance means with, with plastic piping, so we couldn't keep the water up in the compost the, the, the right way. Um, we couldn't pour concrete pads to to make sure that we could you know manage it. We we didn't have tractors with front end loaders. I mean, farmers were still using mules in my part of the world until the mid 1950s. So that meant that you couldn't handle this material. You had to, you had to how, how were you supposed to take, get the carbon combined with the manure? How were you supposed to do this and do it in a volume when instead you could just go down and buy a little bag of 10, 10, 10 from the corner store that was real cheap because it was just leftover gunpowder, right? And you could just buy that, spread it on your field, and you got instant results. See, be real careful about demonizing our great-grandfathers for making that choice. Well, we move into the 1950s. Now we've got rural electrification. Mid-1950s, now we've got tractors. We've got PTO shafts, manure spreaders. Now we've got, we've got chipper shredders. We've got machinery. So I'm very forgiving for the farmers up to about 1950. And then I'm less forgiving from 1950 on. And from 1960 on, no forgiveness whatsoever. <laughs> Here's the point, folks. If we had had a Manhattan project for compost, not only would we have fed the world, we would have done it without three-legged frogs, infertile salamanders, and a dead zone the size of New Jersey and the Gulf of Mexico. That's the truth. The fact is that the, the, the emphasis of the entire world, and certainly our culture specifically, was focused on chemical NPK for the war effort and funneled billions of dollars into the research, the distribution, the packaging, the, the, the building of the industry to make NP and K, and after the war effort, all of that investment was just sitting there, war effort subsidized, are you with me, to be released on the American landscape that, and the farming landscape that was starved for something besides shoveling poop and infertile soils. And so farmers gobbled it up. And the Extension Service and the U.S. Duh sent, U.S. Duh, right, sent, you know, experts into the field with great big, you know, alphabet soup credentials behind their names to promote this. And, 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 go, and use the land-grant universities as the, the shills of the DuPonts 
and the Monsantos to encourage farmers to use this and give free steak dinners to teach them to use it. And they're still doing it today. I mean, for 30 years, the U.S. duh took farmers like me more recently and sent us to free steak dinners to teach us the new progressive scientific way of feeding cows, which is where we grind up dead cows and we feed them back to cows. And because we didn't go and we didn't agree with it and wrote against it and spoke against it, we were considered Luddites, Neanderthal, barbarian, you know, Ice Age, unprogressive, you know, blah, 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 you know. 30 years later, there's this big worldwide, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought to have done that. As bovine spongiform encephalopathy raised its ugly head, also known as mad cap. Don't you think it's kind of disingenuous for the very experts who gave us mad cow disease to ask to be put in charge of food safety? Is that not intellectual schizophrenia? <laughs> or those are the people we listen to to tell us how we're supposed to feed ourselves? I mean, 1979, remember? Uh, a lot of you weren't even born in 1979. Um, when the food pyramid came out, it was the first time that the U.S. duh told us officially how we were supposed to eat. And of course, what went on the bottom of the pyramid? Carbohydrates. Grain. But they didn't differentiate between Tinkies, Pop-Tarts, and, and Count Chocula Fruit Loops, and, and, and fresh sprouted you know, uh, quinoa grain bread that you ground in your thing and sprouted and baked in your oven. They didn't differentiate between those two things. So you can lay down the type 2 diabetes and the obesity epidemic in our culture. You can lay that, those, those numbers down and those charts and they mirror exactly the food pyramid. I think it's profound that we would have a much healthier culture today if the government, if the state, had never decided to tell us how to eat. So, here we come. We come through the 40s. We enter the 50s. By the time the 60s roll around, guess what? We've got PTO. We've got plastic pipe. We can get water. We've got efficient pumping. We've got all sorts of cool stuff to really leverage, to metabolize Sir Albert Howard's gift. You see, the truth of innovation, the truth of innovation is that there's always a ragged edge of infrastructure and, and uh, logistics and information and policy behind the point of the innovation. Right now, in our culture, we're wrestling with the e-commerce innovation. eBay, Amazon.com. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that local, a lot of local and state taxes are funded by sales tax, right? Sales tax is predicated on a physical cash register presence, cha-ching, interface between customer and seller, where you can siphon off that sales tax amount. Well, what happens when there's no physical cha-ching? Suddenly, there are no tax collection. All right? Now, it's getting sorted out. As you know, you can watch the newspaper every day, and you're seeing it get sorted out. But it takes, there's a lag time for, for the, there's a lag time for the innovative thing to be completely metabolized so that all the infrastructure and the understanding went along with it. That's exactly what happened with Sir Albert Howard's composting. He was able to develop it in India during the 1930s because he had cheap labor, lots of organic matter, and, he, and he, had, he had an interest in this. And so he used you know, cheap Indian labor to use machetes and chop carbon and shred it up and, and do these, you know, these experiments that would have already been cost prohibitive in the U.S. where labor was far more expensive. And so it took, it took 10 to 20 years for the most rudimentary infrastructure 
of, of carbon handling with front end loaders and chippers and shredders and, and, and water distribution systems and PTO powered manure spreaders and the, the, the most rudimentary infrastructure to be able to leverage his innovation, which was scientific composting. Are you with me? The private sector financed all that. We, I'm going to say we, we did not get help from the government. We didn't get help from the Defense Department. The Pentagon didn't put composting in their budget. You know, DuPont didn't put in a, a you know a proposal to the Defense Department for composting. All right, you know, it's it's as if it's as if um, bombs and 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 uh, sterile chemical NPK is more sexy than compost. <laughs> I would suggest there's a lot more sex in compost than there is in you know NPK chemical fertilizer, but. It's like there was no interest in this, you see. And it took a while for our side to get the stuff together. Well, my goodness, now today we move into the 70s, we move into the 80s. Today, my goodness, we've got, we've got all the leverage infrastructure. We've got, we've got landfills. I mean, this was in the day before landfills. About that time landfills started, we were so unclever about what to do with waste biomass. That's like an oxymoron. I hope you get that. Waste biomass, all right? I mean, biomass is solar energy that's supposed to decompose and feed this community of beings in the soil under us, right? That's what it's there for. But 80% of all the biomass generated in our country has gone into landfills. If that biomass had been composted, not only would we have not used chemical fertilizers, we would have been able to maintain the fertility and the community of beings in our soil because we would have been feeding them instead of treating the soil as some inert material that we stick in chemical IVs to grow hybrid plants with. And we would have maintained nutrient density in our foods instead of nutrient deficiency. Every single measure of nutrition from cabbage leaves to beef, to eggs, to, to uh, uh, lettuce, shows a plummeting nutrient, nutrient amount in food in the U.S. Ultimately, you cannot, have, you cannot have a healthy culture until you have a healthy soil. Just to show you how prescient and prophetic Sir Albert Howard was, in 1943, an agricultural testament, listen to this quotation from the book. He said, when we feed our soils with artificial manures, that's what he called chemical fertilizers, artificial manures, it grows artificial plants that feed artificial animals, that create artificial people who can only stay alive by using artificials. Tell me the guy wasn't on. See, you know, the, the, the problem, folks, is not that we don't, we don't know. The problem is we don't do. See, we've known this cycle. We've known how this works for a long time, and we haven't leveraged it. But what now, goodness, now we have all the infrastructure. We have the distribution systems. And in fact, I would even suggest that if the bonanza of petroleum if the bonanza, I'm going to call it a bonanza. I mean, never has, has, has humankind had cheap energy at its fingertips. Think about it. Never. I mean, before petroleum, if you wanted to go somewhere, you had to saddle up a horse that you had to feed and groom. Right? If you wanted to go somewhere, you had to get in a ship and wait for the wind to blow. All right? I mean, you know, it's just hard for us to conceive of a world that doesn't have cheap energy. And if we and that cheap energy, I would submit that cheap energy came right at a, a perfect time in human's history when we had enough, enough know-how, mechanical ability and chemistry and knowledge and microscopes and an understanding to leverage what should have been a bonanza of soil healing, composting, organic matter, feeding of the soil biotic community and healing all the lands that our humanity had destroyed for all these years. Instead of healing it, we just took it, put it in the chemical fertilizer, and continued to rape and pillage and assault the ecology and our, and our in, in ecological umbilical. So we have the know-how today. We have the technology today to do that. I mean, now, my goodness, now we've got, we've got um, 
the electromagnetically charged um, foliar fertilizer emulsion sprayed through, you know, special tubes that are beaming out calypso, you know, um, Caribbean music, you know, to make the stomata open real wide and, you know, receive foliar fertilizer. I mean, we, we have all sorts of cool stuff. The fact is that our side is spinning circles around the other side. They just don't know it yet. And there's a tremendous amount of inertia to protect it. You have to understand. People say, well, well you know, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I understand it. And then they come to our farm and they study the production. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're producing five times you know, what anybody else is doing and all this. And they say, well, why don't other people do this? The answer is, if this became widely used, it would completely invert the power, position, prestige, and profits of the entire food and farming system in the world. And that's a big ship to turn around. Finally, okay, so, so, we, so we, we dealt with, dealt with the scientific context just to make you dubious about the reports that you read. Number two, we dealt with the historical context of, of, how, of how composting developed and how, the, or, how the, the, carbon, you know, the carbon cycle developed parallel to the, the chemical approach, okay? And I hope I've convinced you that there's enough there's enough carbon. I mean, my goodness, we're, we're, we're burning manure in California to generate electricity. Is that not nuts? So we haven't learned our lesson. Okay. So the third thing I want to deal with is, yeah, I'll do this quick, quickly. The third thing I want to deal with is that fundamentally, we can only feed the world when we have an integrated food system, not a segregated food system. Now, I know segregation is a very strong word, and I've chosen it on purpose, because a segregated food system is fundamentally an assault against the embeddedness of this whole carbon cycle. You see, what we've done is we've put the, we've put the, 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 the fertilizer over here, We've put the crops over here. We've put the processing over here. We've put the supermarkets over here. We've put the people over here. And we send their poop down to, you know, a, a waste facility that doesn't even use it. And, and all of these systems that are supposed to be intricately, relationally complex and, and synergized are broken apart. And so all of the assets of plant decomposition or manure decomposition or all, all of those assets that are supposed to cycle tightly on location are now liabilities in, in their certain spots instead of being assets where they're supposed to be. See, nature doesn't move carbon around very much. Do you ever think about that? Nature doesn't move carbon around very much. I mean, about the most nature moves carbon around is like as far as it took you know, a buffalo to eat grass here and go up here on a ridgetop and poop. You know, that's not that far. Uh, 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 about as far as it took birds, birds to you know, eat worms and seeds down here and go up to a tree and, and poop, okay? Um, about as far as wind blows fall, you know, deciduous leaves that are falling on the ground. Wind blows those leaves, but it doesn't blow them, you know, across the state. The, the, nature's carbon cycle is really close, all right? It's supposed to revolve around in a, in a close, tight-knit circle. It's supposed to be integrated. Let me give you an example. If every kitchen in America, both institutional and domestic, had enough chickens attached to it to eat the scraps coming out of that kitchen, there would be no poultry industry in the country. So we get around and we march against, you know, factory farmed eggs and factory farmed chickens and Tyson and blah, blah, blah. And actually... The role of omnivorous chickens in history was to recycle food scraps. That's why they were around all the, you know, all the uh, homesteads. I mean, even urban places. 
a city in Belgium. This is written up in, um, in City Chicks, a new book. Uh, it's been out for about a year by Pat Foreman, the chicken whisperer. Um, she, uh, she's written this book, Chick, uh, City Chicks, and she talks about a, country, a, a city in Belgium that launched a pilot program and said, uh, we will give three chickens to any household in the town that wants three chickens. And so 2,000 households signed up. They got 6,000 chickens, distributed them three apiece to these 2,000 households. And in the first month of the program, reduced the landfill stream by 100 tons. So, you don't need a pet dog, a pet cat, a gerbil, a hamster, the aquarium. Throw that all out and get two chickens, you see? They're a lot cleaner. You can almost eat the manure. You can use it to side dress your flowers and your, you know, your pot garden on a patio. I mean, pot. I mean, they're, they're in pots, not good. <laughs> and then you don't have to worry about the compost bin and the, or you can have vermicomposting and feed it into the earthworms. And you, see, what we've got today, we've got, you know, we've got colleges that are giving, you know, greeny awards to the dining services when they're so progressive that they separate out their kitchen scraps into compost bins so they can go on a diesel truck to go 10 miles out of town to a composting facility so that after it's composted, it can come back to the campus and go on the azaleas and the rose bushes to beautify the campus. That is completely segregationist thinking. What would really be green and ecological would be to put 200 chickens in a house up next to the back door of the dining services. All the kitchen scraps come out to the chickens. The eggs go back in. The manure goes into the azaleas, and, or the manure goes into the, uh, the edible landscaping, the apple trees and the pear trees. And, and we divide the campus up into little uh, GPS grids, right? And so the kids all get a, phone, a smartphone app. So when they get up in the morning, you know, it gives them, you know, the strawberries in grid 34 ready to pick. And all the students go over and eat strawberries, you know. And, and next day they get up and, the, you know, the, the asparagus in uh, grid 5 is ready to pick. You know, so go to eat asparagus. And the gra students just graze from, you know, class to class and <laughs> across the campus. And suddenly, suddenly, folks, with an embedded, integrated system, instead of living paranoid and in fear of scarcity and running out of things, we're suddenly nested into the abundance that is our womb. And that has, that has tremendous spiritual, emotional, economic, and ecological consequences. So as we, as we look to how do we feed the world, the question is not so much you know, whether compost works. The question is not uh, um, you know, whether local systems work. The questions are these big questions. The, the question is how do we create an integrated, embedded food system in this nest? How do, we, how do we walk, how do we move on this planet in a way that heals it instead of rapes it? How do we caress our nest as a lover rather than demanding from it like a rapist. That's the question of our day. And fortunately, all of us in some sphere of influence, in some way, can participate in this great, sanctified, reverential, holy ministry of healing the planet. God help us to do it. Let's help us, let's, let's all understand that the future, the future we paint for our children and our grandchildren will be painted one bite at a time by the food choices that we make. And I'm not here to throw a good guilt complex. You know, I like a Snickers bar about once a year too, all right? It's okay. I'm not here to create, you know, food Nazis, all right? But I am here to pose the question. At the end of the week, has my eating, has it helped the earthworm or hurt the earthworm? Has it built soil or hurt soil? Those are the questions that we need to ask. And as we ask those questions, we can participate. So fundamentally, we can feed the world. We can feed the world if we localize our decision makings and our participatory power. What this means is we have to get back in our kitchens, folks. We can't just live on boxed stuff. We can't live out of the microwave. Fundamentally, we need to bring, in order, if we're going to have 
an integrated embedded food system on our patios, on our rooftops, in our backyards, at our farmers markets, at our CSAs, at our roadside stands, at our metropolitan drop points, at whatever it is how we interact, what it means is we need to treat the supermarket like a bad food addiction and we need to, we need to get proactive about coming to our kitchens that have never been so techno glitzy gadgetized but been so unused. I mean, no culture has ever spent more money remodeling kitchens and been more lost as to where they are. I'm not talking about going back to, you know, ringer washers, hoop skirts, and hearth cookings, as romantic as that may sound to somebody. I'm talking about using our Cuisinart, using our slow cookers, using Time Bake, using, you know, all the cool, the dehydrators and all the cool stuff we have to ultimately participate in both growing and accumulating you know, turn off the TV and go find your food treasures in, community, in your community. Every community is surrounded by integrity farmers that are building soils that do care about the ecological profit loss system and that that, that that is far more important than the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We need to be patronizing them, bringing their whole foods into our homes, preparing, packaging, and processing them so when we lie down at night with our beloved, we are nearby within touching distance of the earth's abundance which is a visceral object lesson of grace and provision and sufficiency. And that will help our attitude, it will help our health, and it will help our conscience in fundamentally participating in the healing of this nest that we call the earth. I hope we're up to the task, and I send you forth to touch yourself, to look in the mirror and say, what can I do? And do one little thing. Don't try to solve it all at one time. And just remember that the, the, the earth that our children will inherit will be built by the trillions and trillions of individual decisions that we make as we go from here day to day. Do we go to the Caribbean cruise when all the tomatoes in the community are, you know, a, a week before frost? Do you know that when the tomatoes are, are, are a week before frost, all the tomatoes talk and say, let's all ripen this week. You know? And they do. Well, if we plant our Caribbean cruise the week the tomatoes harvest, who, all those tomatoes get thrown, thrown away. And that happens all around the place. Those need to be turned into salsa and juice and canned and, 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 and packaged for winter. So we're not buying tomatoes from... Cancun and Peru in February. Are you with me? And we need to be putting solariums on the sides of our houses. All the southern sides need to have solariums on so we can grow mescaline mix in January and we can heat our houses with passive solar. This is not high tech. We need to, we need to change our, our plumbing to all of our gray water going into a sump so it can go into the toilet so we're not using potable water in the toilets. I mean, that drops our water consumption in half. I mean, there's, there, are, there are so many low tech, really basic things that we can do. I know it's easier to write letters it's easier to send nasty emails. It's easier to sign petitions. It's easy to talk. I'm encouraging us all to walk. God help us to do it. Thank you for letting me visit with you. Now, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large and not pithy. Um, if you're running uh, chickens, may the neighbor's dogs um, not know what a chicken is. May your, may your culinary experiments be palatably delectable. <laughs> may the rain fall gently on your fields, the wind be always at your back, your children rise up and call you blessed, and may we all make this a better world than we inherited. Thank you so much for letting me visit with you. Thank you. <laughs>